Hey everyone, uh, so welcome to another lecture in the series Neurology for the Non-Neurologist. Uh, in this lecture I'm going to break down some different stroke etiologies and how we work them up inpatient. Uh, strokes are really common neurologic disease, so you're going to see a lot of this uh, work up while we're inpatient. Uh, so hopefully it's really helpful for you. Uh, as a reminder, Neurology for the Non-Neurologist, or NFTNN, um, it's a series of rapid review topics, um, things you're going to experience inpatient, but it's, it's not a comprehensive review of the field of neurology. Um, so that's just my disclaimer. All right, so let's go through what we'll be discussing today. Uh, so this lecture is going to actually be split into two different lectures. It has really two components. Uh, first half, we're going to break down stroke by type and then kind of talk about their associated treatment and secondary prevention. And then the second half, we'll be discussing how the workup uh, to determine this is actually performed. So in order to understand classification of stroke, and specifically ischemic stroke, you have to have a basic understanding of a, a, a study from 1993 called the TOAST study, or Trial of Organization in Acute Stroke Treatment. Uh, basically, it was a, a study that just separated stroke into five categories based on uh, pathophysiology, uh, so large vessel, small vessel, cardiomembolic, cryptogenic, and other. Uh, so we have this classification, and that's fine, but you're, you're probably sitting there falling asleep already um, as I talk about this. So why the heck do we really care about one trial that was made 30 years ago? So to be honest, there's there's dozens of different ways of dividing ischemic stroke into subtype. And regardless of how they're grouped, etiologies don't always fall into clear patterns. Uh, so the question then remains, why do we care? Uh, so the main reason we care and the main reason why I like to divide ischemic stroke by toast classification um, is it guides your approach to secondary prevention. I'll show you what I mean um, as we go through each of these, but for example, large vessel stroke is treated differently than cardioembolic stroke, uh, treated differently than small vessel stroke. Uh, so being, by being able to lump multiple ischemic stroke etiologies into larger groups, it makes secondary prevention a lot more approachable. So let's get into our first toast subtype, which is large vessel disease. Uh, so large vessel disease is a disease of the carotids, which are considered extracranial vessels and the proximal branches of the circle of Willis, uh, so the ACA, MCA, PCA, which are considered intracranial large vessels. Uh, given that these large vessels um, affect a large area of the cortex, typically these are very large strokes and can be quite debilitating. Uh, so a couple different mechanisms come into play in these strokes, but all these are a result of atherosclerosis. Uh, so you can either have in situ thrombosis, which is clot formation at the si site of athero, or you can have embolization of unstable plaque, um, or you can have significant athero actually build up, and even without forming a clot, can lead to a critical stenosis, uh, where not enough blood is being able to be pumped through. Uh, these people are very prone to blood pressure swings and can easily stroke out if they're too hypotensive. Uh, if you see a patient who keeps having TIAs in the same neurologic distribution, it's likely that uh, this is what's going on, and so you should really look at the vessels carefully. So as I said, TOAST criteria is really nice because it simplifies treatment um, based on category. And in this case, there's actually two different approaches, and that depends on if it's intracranial or extracranial disease. Uh, so extracranial, which again refers to disease of the carotids, is treated surgically with either a carotid endarterectomy or carotid stenting. Uh, patients are a candidate if they have greater than 70% occlusion of the carotids. Uh, and then we'll actually treat a lot of patients with 50 to 69 percent inclusion if they have a good life expectancy. Uh, you probably learned back in the day there was a lot of rules based on gender and some other vague details, but we don't really follow those anymore. Uh, intracranial disease, on the other hand, uh, which refers to the proximal parts of the uh, ACA, MCA, and PCA, uh, is typically treated with dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, typically with aspirin and Plavix, and usually anywhere from 21 to 90 days. Uh, the exact timing and indication of this can get kind of convoluted, uh, but it does stem from two major stroke articles, uh, Sampras and Point, which I hyperlinked up in the top right of the slide just in case attendings ask you about them. So the next major subtype of stroke um, by toast classification is small vessel disease. Uh, so small vessel disease, uh, as the name suggests, involves the small vessels of the brain, um, and those are the ones that typically feed the subcortical regions of the brain. Uh, so you'll see affected structures including the thalamus, the internal capsule, like here in this picture, uh, the basal ganglia, the brainstem. You know, these strokes are typically very small, usually smaller than two centimeters, and you'll hear them referred to as lacunar strokes at times. 
Uh, so small vessel disease is caused by lipohyalinosis, which is hypertrophy of the arterial smooth, smooth muscle. Um, eventually, the arterial wall hypertrophies so much that it clamps off the vessel, and it can lead to, ox or lead to a lack of oxygen in the distal vessel. Uh, lipohyalinosis is most associated with chronic hypertension, which is usually the cause of small vessel disease, um, but also can be caused by smoking, diabetes, and other similar causes. Uh, so as expected, secondary prevention for this group really focuses around controlling those risk factors. Uh, so these patients are going to get strict blood pressure control, they're going to have smoking cessation, um, education, and then in addition to that, we're always going to put these patients in a high-intensity statin and also on weight-based aspirin. Uh, so weight-based aspirin is a newer concept in stroke neurology, uh, which is gaining a lot of steam recently. It's derived from this uh, recent Lancet meta-analysis, which I hyperlinked above. Uh, that demonstrated that stroke patients over 70 kilos had better outcomes when they're placed on a large dose of aspirin. Uh, so we we'll actually place patients over 70 kilos on 325 milligrams of aspirin, while we keep other patients on the traditional 81 milligrams. All right, quick pause. Uh, here's a picture of my dog Willow, which you probably should look at. I mean, look at that. Does it get any better than that? Okay, so the next subtype of strokes that we often see are cardioembolic strokes. Uh, so similar to large vessel strokes, these strokes affect large cortical territories like the entire MCA or PCA. Uh, however, contrary to large vessel strokes, uh, these patients typically have relatively unremarkable vessel imaging. And furthermore, these patients will often have multifocal strokes. Um, I'll discuss this a bit later, but multiple strokes in different vascular territories heavily favor the cardioembolic source as compared to large vessel disease. Uh, so AFib is by far the most common cause of cardioembolic stroke, and it's something that you're guaranteed to see in our service. Uh, the fact that these strokes are so common is why AFib is taken so seriously by cardiology, and why you really need very few risk factors on a CHADS-VAS scoring uh, to be in candidate for anticoagulation. Uh, other causes of cardioembolic stroke include left ventricular or left atrial thrombus, uh, such as the one seen here in the picture, um, or a PFO with associated DVT is another cause. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as a paradoxical stroke. Technically, endocarditis is considered cardioembolic within those criteria, but I'll discuss in a, uh, in a second why this is an exception. Uh, so secondary prevention of cardioembolic stroke is all about anticoagulation. So stroke in the setting of AFib, regardless of the medical history, uh, gives you two points on CHADS VAS scoring and so commits you to um, a lifelong or a, a life of anticoagulation. Uh, other cardioembolic strokes will definitely need to be anticoagulated, but the the duration kind of depends on if you can get rid of the risk factors. So for example, if you can close the PFO, they can eventually come off anticoagulation. Uh, DOAX and specifically apixaban is usually your treatment of choice, uh, but there's certain conditions like LV thrombuses where this hasn't been studied yet, and so we instead default to warfarin. Uh, so now endocarditis on the other hand, unfortunately breaks our, our lovely treat based on toast classification rule. Um, so this is because of the fact that septic emboli actually have a really high propensity of bleeding um, and can lead to hemorrhagic conversion. Uh, so we'll actually treat these patients with antibiotics uh, instead of anticoagulation and depending on size, they'll need even cardiothoracic surgical intervention. Uh, so end of story, don't do drugs, kids. All right, the next category of toast classification is the cryptogenic stroke. Uh, so cryptogenic stroke is a stroke where no identifiable cause can be elucidated. Uh, despite a pretty thorough diagnostic evaluation. Uh, so these strokes are also referred to often as ESIS, or embolic, source, or embolic stroke of undetermined source. Um, this is because they're typically embolic, but that's not always the case. But you may hear ESIS tossed around. Uh, so there's several possible mechanisms for cryptogenic stroke. Uh, again, AFib here is a really key player. It actually turns out that about 25 to 50 percent of these patients end up having occult paroxysmal AFib. Uh, other possible causes that are being researched include atrial septal abnormalities, uh, PFO without DVT. Uh, remember, a PFO with a DVT is considered cardioembolic. Uh, atrial cardiopathy, uh, embolism from athro disease in the proximal aorta, and then there's a couple more. Uh, so currently, secondary prevention of stroke is a, a, a or, sorry, secondary prevention of cryptogenic stroke is a, a pretty hotly debated topic. Um, as of now, there's really no benefit for anticoagulation, um, or no good evidence for it at least, um, but there's actually a lot of trials going on right now. Uh, hyperlinked one above called Arcadia uh, that you may see going on here at UC, 
Um, but in the meantime, we, again, don't have great evidence for anticoagulation, so we typically treat these patients as if it was small vessel disease, and we'll place them on weight-based aspirin and high-intensity statin. Uh, the most important thing to remember, though, and I'll get into this later, is that you have to rule out a cold AFib. Again, that's by far the most common cause in these patients. So we're going to be doing outpatient cardiac rhythm monitoring. Again, I'll discuss this later during the workup portion of the topic. Okay, and then finally, with all classification systems in medicine, there's, there's several diseases that don't really fit well into one category. Um, and in the TOAST trial, they aptly name these other identifiable causes. Uh, so this list is pretty extensive, includes a lot of fun zebras, uh, so things ranging from hereditary diseases like catacil to vasculitides to moya moya, which you can see here on the right. Um, it's a pretty long list, and usually neurologists geek out about it, and most of the docs roll their eyes about it, uh, but there are a few important diseases you should be familiar with here. Uh, so this includes dissection of the neck, um, or of the neck vessels. Uh, this can happen during trauma or spontaneously. It can lead to clot formation and ischemia, and it's, it's not a rare cause, something you may see. Uh, and then hypercoagulability is actually a really important cause to keep in mind also. Um, one of the big things is these are really difficult to treat sometimes. They can be refractory to treatment, and they also can be a harbinger of something more ominous, such as a malignancy. So again, a lot of these diseases, they're, they're worked up in kind of unique ways, they're treated in unique ways, it's probably not worth wasting your time on them unless you're a neurology resident, um, but it's likely you'll run into a couple of these at least during your rotation. Okay, now before we move into hemorrhagic stroke, I just want to bring up a concept that I've touched on a few times so far, um, but I really want to reemphasize it, and that's using location of stroke to determine its etiology. Uh, so one way to differentiate between stroke subtypes is whether they affect cortical regions of the brain or subcortical regions. Uh, so it's important to understand that the cortex is the distal gray matter, uh, where the subcortex is more the deep gray matter. So if I draw here up on this, uh, cortex is going to be around this area versus subcortex is going to really be in here. Um, this matters because uh, subcortical strokes are almost typically small vessel in nature, whereas uh, large vessel strokes or cardioembolic strokes or cryptogenic strokes almost all affect cortex. Um, so it really helps you narrow your differential just by noticing that location. And then another really important concept to understand is the distribution of circulation supplied by the circle willis. Uh, so if you look at this picture here, you can see that uh, each part of the brain is supplied distinctly by either the ACA in yellow or the MCA in red or the PCA in blue. Um, so if you have disease of a single large vessel, um, you would expect damage in only that area. So for example, if you had uh, a right MCA stroke, you should only see damage in the area here highlighted in red on the right. Um, one slight exception to this is you'll hear something called an anterior circulation stroke, uh, which is a stroke of both the ACA and the MCA, um, as they're fed by both the, or they're both fed by the internal carotid. Uh, so that's considered also a single vascular distribution. Uh, why this is important is because if you see multiple strokes in multiple vascular territories, uh, such as the right and left MCA, or the right MCA and the right PCA. Uh, we know that a stroke came from some proximal source, uh, usually cardioembolic. Um, either that or we know that there's some diffuse process that's affecting all the vessels. So that's things like hypercoagulable disease, or vasculitis, or vasospasm. Um, so if a patient has multifocal strokes and you can't find an obvious cardioembolic source, you really have to work up these other diseases extensively. All right, so that's it. Ischemic stroke, it's, it's a doozy. Um, so things get a lot more simple going forward. Uh, take a breath and look at Willow as a puppy sitting in a bucket. All right. Let's talk about hemorrhagic stroke. Um, it's a lot simpler to classify than ischemic. Um, so first off, please don't make the mistake that I used to make when I was first learning about hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, when we refer to primary hemorrhagic stroke, we're usually referring to an intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, known as an ICH. Uh, hemorrhagic stroke does not refer to just anything that bleeds in the brain. So that doesn't mean we're talking about ischemic strokes with hemorrhagic inversion, and that doesn't mean we're talking about intracranial bleeds such as subarachnoid hemorrhages or subdurals or epidurals. Uh, this is really nice because uh, there's really only a limited number of things that can cause a true ICH. Uh, the most common cause of ICH is actually traumatic, but we'll focus less on that because that's a surgical topic. 
Uh, following trauma, uncontrolled hypertension is by far the leading cause of hemorrhagic stroke in adults. Uh, this occurs in the very small vessels, which are the same ones that actually cause small vessel ischemic lacunar strokes. Um, and it can lead to bleeding in those same areas, so the basal ganglia, the thalamus. Uh, these vessels are often implicated in hypertension just because they're small, frail vessels that take a 90 degree turn off their large parent vessels. Mm. On the contrary, more peripheral or cortically based bleeds, uh, such as you see here in this picture, um, are often seen in a disease called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, or CAA. Uh, so CAA is a disease typically of the elderly Caucasian male, um, likely associated with Alzheimer's, and that's because uh, amyloid builds up in these vessels. And remember, in Alzheimer's, they often have a buildup of amyloid plaque as well. Um, but the amyloid buildup here makes the vessels very fragile, specifically along the gray-white junction. And so patients with CAA will often have large cortical hemorrhages, um, and when they get MRIs done, they'll actually be riddled with these small microbleeds, like you can see here, all these little black dots, um, typically, again, in the gray-white junction. Uh, unfortunately, hemorrhagic strokes are very difficult to treat. Uh, these patients often do pretty poorly. And really, the only effective secondary prevention in these patients is uh, strict blood pressure control. Um, interestingly, high cholesterol has actually been found to be protective in these patients, so we don't always put them on a statin unless we have other reasons to do so. Uh, we don't really understand the reasoning behind this, but it has something to do with stabilizing the vessel walls. Uh, I did include a link to an AHA article about it in the top right if anyone's interested. Uh, and then finally, one thing to remember is spontaneous ICHs may occur in an area where uh, vessels are disrupted by an underlying lesion. Um, so if you really don't have a good reason why they had an ICH, uh, like if they didn't show up with a blood pressure of 240, uh, you should probably consider repeating imaging in a couple of weeks just to make sure there's not an underlying malignancy or vascular malformation. All right, so one last thing I want to touch on uh, before we move on to stroke workup is the concept of stroke recrudescence. Um, I feel like this is a, a topic that can be confusing, but it's actually quite common and important to understand. Uh, so recrudescence is a phenomenon where a patient experiences a reemergence or a worsening of previously recovered stroke deficits, uh, typically in the setting of a new acute stressor. Um, and then it's important to know that these patients don't have any new evidence of stroke. Uh, so, for example, a patient with a prior right MCA stroke who previously had left-sided weakness uh, may develop recurrence of their weakness during a UTI. Uh, UTI is the most common cause of recrudescence, but it can be caused by pretty much any type of severe infection, um, as well as any metabolic or physiologic disturbance. Um, I know that makes it sound like a very convenient excuse for neurology to turf patients to medicine. Uh, but it's a, a real phenomenon, and if the patient's underlying disease is treated, uh, they, they will return to the neurologic baseline. Um, I think the easiest way to understand recrudescence is to understand that neurons previously damaged in stroke will have lost their optimal capacity to function. Uh, so plasticity allows patients to develop some collaterals and eventually regain some good function. Uh, but once you damage an area, it's always going to have a low reserve. Uh, so when there's any systemic process that occurs, uh, that's going to shunt energy, effort, and blood away from the brain, uh, such as an infection. Uh, the previously weakened neurons are the first to go, and so this can cause the patient to appear as if they were having the same stroke that they had previously. Uh, if this concept is still confusing, I did attach a JAMA article on it as well. So we did it. Uh, we classified all the strokes you'll see based on subtype, and now comes the easy part. Well, what we do to determine the type of stroke that they had, uh, and what kind of workup we're going to do. So we'll talk about that in a secondary lecture, though.